but I wanted to get into some of the sleepers. Uh, in, in this conference, we know what the East powers are like. But we got some teams that are lurking. Over in the West, it's wide ass open. And we're going to talk mm-hmm. about some of the battles that may go on because I know we got some thoughts about the West here. But starting off in the East, Hack, it's your time. I mean, yeah. is Penn State, are they, are they going to return to form as that team in the East that can challenge Ohio State, that team in the East that's going to get a win over Michigan and put themselves in position? Or do you see some of the same issues that we've seen in the last couple of years that might pop up again? Listen, I think I think they were there even before Michigan showed their head up until last year. I think they were there, right? But I think, again, and I've beat this horse and we talked about it before we came on air here, It it's last year they could not run the football and the minute mm. Cliff went down, all of the gadgety kind of like one-off, game plans that came into it just didn't work out because you didn't have a guy pulling the trigger who was super comfortable with that and obviously didn't have a ton of reps at it. Right. So um, that's a big point. I think they got some depth at that position. Now I think that shores some things up. I think Cliff's very confident and obviously, you know, has, has some, uh, has some stuff to build on this year. I thought they did a decent job in the transfer portal. I think their receiver room has the ability to not take a step down really after good. losing dots. And I love the Mitchell Tinsley kid. I think he's going to yeah. be really good. Parker, Washington's um, Parker, Washington's fun. He's a great player. And I, I just the way he's matured. So I think there's things that play into their schedule um, or that play into their ability to do it. But I think it's going to ultimately uh, fall on the coaching staff. You know, they got to, they got to figure out a way how to put these guys in situations to be successful, create an identity and run with it throughout the year. Um, you know, defensively, I thought Manny Diaz was a great ad. Um, I think he's a great football mind. I think they have some returners there that are going to, that are going to be able to, to adjust to that change. But ultimately I'm still like with Penn state, I'm still in a wait and see. And I think that the one thing that's been missing there for a really long time has been the ability to turn around and hand the football off with the exception of Saquon, who's a once in a generation talent at the end of the day, when you cut through all the BS, he is, um, you got to be able to run the football and at a place like Penn state, you definitely have to be able to run the football with the history that comes into that. So yeah, that's where I, that's what I want to see. I want to see them be able to turn around, take some pressure off cliff and just let him operate in off of play action and, and, and in a veteran type of role where he can, he can make some explosives um, without as much pressure. That run game is a a legit problem. I want to read this stat to you. Uh, Penn state second to last in the big 10. In uh, average per carry, uh, the mm-hmm. last team was Purdue, and we know that they don't even attempt to run the football. Right. Um, so that's a really tough spot to be in. Their longest touchdown run, Penn State, last season was seven yards. That's a staggering number when you really start to think about it, and especially a program like Penn State. They just have not been able to get that O-line together. Jake is a guy who evaluates offensive football. You came from a tough and rugged type of system. Um it, Outside of just having better players, how do you build an offensive line so they can go out there and create the gaps when they need to run the football? Yeah, I think the another factor outside of running the ball is Sean Clifford's been great when he's been healthy, you know, so yeah. keeping him on his feet and clean in the pocket is only going to benefit him. I mean, th- this this starts with, you know, one good thing to consider here is, is they Clifford mentioned he had four offensive coordinators in six years. So again, when you're having turnover, you're essentially learning a new language. So those offensive linemen, rather than emphasize your technique within the scheme, you're learning a new language so you can talk about your calls, how to identify the defense, getting everybody on the same page. So having the return of the same coordinator, that should benefit them right off the jump where now they can they can focus on their technique. But, um, you know, getting five guys to play as one unit and getting the tight ends involved. For the most part, when you have a one-on-one matchup, you don't necessarily need to knock somebody off the ball all of the time. It's when you have the double teams. When you have 600 pounds on 300 pounds, can you then generate movement? And how you do that is you have to – it's it's peewee football. It's shoulder-to-shoulder. It's hip-to-hip. It's pad level. It's getting the guy lifted up and back on his heels – and then you drive your feet and generate movement. So I think foundationally it starts with the fact that you're, you have an uh, offensive coordinator back for the same year. They should be able to, you know, ev- you know, work on the technique rather than the new language. That should benefit them um, just from the jump right away. 
Yeah, and I, I, Hack, you mentioned their defense. I think their defense is yeah. going to be really good. You got Joey Porter Jr., who could be a first-round pick. Jair Brown was probably one of the players on defense in the conference we didn't talk enough about last year. And P.J. Mustafer being healthy, I think yeah. it's bigger probably for leadership than it is on the X's and O's standpoint. But we saw that their defense took a step back last year when he got hurt.